Hey, what's up? This is Carl Craig, straight from High in Ibiza. Glitter box, once more, for Carl Craig asks. Uncle Carl asks. And today we have a very special guest, Mr. Luke Solomon, who is uh, the man. This guy <laughs> did a track that's on Beyonce's album. It's Two, incredible two feet. Two tracks. Two tracks. That's on Beyonce's album. It's incredible, incredible feet. I don't know who in Detroit has had that. I'm still, I, I still don't even know what to say. Like, I just literally have to like, I'm like, how did that happen? Like, I have no idea. Like, I mean, I know how it happened, but I, have, I still have. It was not on my wish list of things to do. I was like standing in the mirror going, one day I'll make a record with Beyonce. It was never on my list of things I wanted to do. So it happened and I'm here going, wait, holy crap, that was, we did that. So. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. You did with Honey Dijon, yeah? Both so, tracks with Honey? Or yeah, what? yeah, so, it's, so Honey Dijon, myself and Chris Penny, are like we're a trio and we work with Honey on her music and then Honey was approached by Parkwood mysteriously during the pandemic and we was like, Parkwood did some research, Beyonce's record label, and we're like, okay, uh, what is this? We thought that they wanted her to do a live stream or something like that. Yeah. Next thing, two days later, we're on a Zoom call with everyone like Ricky Lawson and all the A&R, Mario Gomez, all the A&R, Andrew McCadsey. We're like, she wants to make this album. She has a vision when everything comes back that, she, that it's going to be clubs and Renaissance is like a rebirth and yeah. blah, blah, blah. And she wants it to be influenced by us. So. We made these playlists for her. She went off and did her homework and then came back. And then we just made, we started working on beats and we get this sort of cloak and dagger feedback of yeah. she was dancing around the kitchen. Can you work on this some more? Right. And, okay. and then it, we just got in, then we would go quiet for three months and we're like, okay, well, we didn't win the lottery. And then it would be like, oh shit, yeah, right. we did win the lottery. <laughs> yeah, right. And it would go like that for like the whole year and a half, yeah. you know? I mean, it's serious. It, it seriously is like winning the lottery when you get a, uh, placement on something that big it, it's, it's but like, I, we you, you know how this industry is like we both know that someone will throw you like the fishing line or you'll get a bite and then I've learned to like lower my expectations I'm like okay well this sounds cool so I'm gonna do it for a minute and if it doesn't work out it's fine yeah and so I've always done that I'm like and then it was like okay wait this might be working out okay wait this is like it was this whole thing I've like still convincing myself now this isn't gonna be a thing right, right. And, and it was and it was like I, I'm even now I'm still pinching myself yeah you know? right, right it still feels surreal sat here I've known you for a long time yeah. sat here talking <laughs> to you about it. it's still like you know wow but yeah yeah, yeah the the um I mean, to, to describe it as winning a lottery for most people would be happy to, you know, win a lottery for $5,000 or, you know, it's like, I won something or won a poker hand mm -hmm. or whatever. But this is almost like winning the Powerball, you know? This is like, it, like your music gets to be heard by, you know, 100 million people yeah. versus, and, you know, depending on how many streams now, I mean, yeah. we're talking yeah. billions of streams yeah. that happen. This is, this is something that, that coming from the underground is is like another is another thing well it, it's like you know i've you, you've you've always been I'm not, I'm not saying this because you're sat here with me I, I, i've you've been a great inspiration your path and all the things that you've done like i've always followed the path of like yourself and derek carter and mm -hmm. of this just like doing my thing and I watch people, you know, I've never been the guy at the top of the bill. I've never been the guy. I've always been in the background working away. And, and then suddenly you get this, I always wanted the recognition, but I was kind of happy, satisfied that it's worked out. You know, I've made right. a living off of it. Yeah. I've done the parties I want to do. I've made the music I want to do. I'm, I was in a good place anyway. So then suddenly something like that happens. And then it just suddenly opens up your mind to like the realms of possibility. It's like this music that we've loved all of our life that suddenly gets this platform that I've always dreamt that it, it got heard. I was, you know, seeing her Beyonce sample Derek Carter for the show and seeing like us getting to sample Cashmere for a record and all these mm -hmm. things, a way of paying back and it paying forward. And it's just like this, this opens up a whole other Pandora's box of, right. box of 
opportunities, not just for us, but for other people, you know, and, and I feel that's a change, that dance music needed that change in a lot of ways, I feel. How much of an impact do you think that Kanye doing uh, Brighter Days at Sunday Service had to has on like Beyonce and other people that that are in his world to opening up, you know, this music that we come from, you know, this underground music that we come from. You know that the whole that whole thing is interesting. Like it's it's like faded. You know, it's like the brief that we got for records that from from the hip hop R and B perspective is like oh my, you know Mr. Fingers like yeah. that bass line deep inside Brighter Days. Gypsy Woman, like that's the go-tos for the for the hip hop kids when they reference house music. Sure, right. And so those, but even that bright that moment that Kanye had with Sunday Service came from Chicago, like as in he has people in the background, yeah. the kids that are going to gramophone and putting voices in his head and saying, yeah. "You should check this out. You should do this. You should check these out." I think that was always, I always felt that there was a point that we would infiltrate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it was like, if we keep working and we keep doing the work and we keep having this time, it will eventually happen because it's interesting with hip hop that they kind of mined every sample, every moment, yeah. everything that you can get to. We had a load of stuff with like sample my beat and we used Peter Raha for Unique and the uh, uh, Barbara Antier and all those things that have been our like history. Yeah. And suddenly I'm going, wait, they don't know this. Like, yeah. they don't know Johnny Dangerous. They don't know, like... And that suddenly, my mind was just like, oh, yeah, wow, right. okay, right. this is a whole... This is opening up a whole world of, of discovery for people, which is, is insane. So I think that that sort of infiltrating in those little ways all along the way as things, you know, see Kenny and Louie's influence on, mu on, on the mainstream and then right. what America has been waiting for post-EDM where I feel like house music for me is the most exciting house music is coming out of America now. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm looking at kids in Brooklyn and mm -hmm. just there's a whole new gen channel oh, trays, people like that. I, I feel excited yeah. by that. Man. It's great. Yeah, I thought the infiltration was going to come when Little Kim sampled Lil Lewis. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that yeah, was... We, we had those glimpses, Slum yeah. Village and Matthew Herbert and around the, de yeah. around the you know, like Daft, Daft Punk. Punk as well, yeah. That's right. and, and I was with you on that. I was like, oh shit, like this could be it. Yeah. You know, Herbert, like, how did they discover Herbert? Because that was like pre-digital days. Yeah. So that was like, how did they discover that? And suddenly it's like, okay, well... Damn it, next yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it, next time. And then I guess the worlds collided and moments happened and everything, the stars aligned at the same yeah, time. Right, right. Couldn't happen to a better guy. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> How did working in a record store influence your you what you do and your career and everything? I think record store, it's interesting. Like, do I miss them? I don't know. I buy as many records as I've ever done. I do it online. I think the thing about record stores is not just that, it wasn't just about the access to music, it was the community around it. Okay. And that's the bit that's missing, I think. It's like, and, and also I think digital music has made DJs lazy as well. I yeah. think there was that situation of going to a record store and you had to go to a record store because you, how are you going to get new records? Are you going to play all the old records that you had and you need to get some new ones? So then you went, then you met like, a load of people there and you hung out and yeah. stuff happened and so I think from as a community based thing record stores are like vital for me it was it was a springboard not just from access to having access to music but also literally going and oh you should come and play this club and do this and do this and that's how I got went to Girls FM you know pirate radio and that's how I got the job at Freetown it all came from working in a record shop sure. but from a is it a pain in the ass now? Yeah, like yeah. I still buy records, I save them, I collect them, I digitize them. I, I don't need to go to a record shop quite so much, I can do it online. Right. So it's, right. it's kind of interesting. There's like, but there's pluses and minuses, I guess. Yeah. But for me, it, it, it was the beginning of everything for me. Yeah. But I guess now, it's especially with, so if you're buying uh, off a of digital, um, the personal suggestions that come when you, because that. I was talking to uh, the promoter last night, Yoakum yeah. in Antwerp, yeah, yeah, and he yeah. said that, that uh, at his record store, you know, if somebody 
picks a track, then he's like, okay, I got a couple of more, more for, for you. you. You know, give these ones a yeah, try. Yeah. And it was, it's yeah. always, and then you know, the you're you're getting suggestions suggestion. from people who live with yeah. music. Yeah, you know, that so, that's a big problem for me. Yeah. That, I mean, I rely on algorithms to discover music. I use Spotify a lot, recommending ways of finding and opening my mind up to music, but. I have a history of searching for music. Mm. Young kids, my kids are on SoundCloud trying to find st stuff with five views that no one knows or some mm. weird hip hop record. Right. And so they still have a way of discovering, but sure. having a valued person that you can go to who's, who you can identify with, has a similar taste and go, you should check these out. Yeah. I miss that. Yeah, yes. It's, I, I mean, rely I'm, on my friends for that. Yeah, right. Well, I guess the only way that we can, can really do it now as record label guys is a and yep. you know? Yeah. So that's our way of, yeah. of doing it now. Yeah, yeah. So how did you and Derek Carter end up linking up? What What's the story about that? It's, well, I'm, it's, a, it's a weird thing of like, how did I end up there? It's, much, it's kind of like the Beyonce story. It's like, well, where did that all come from? I think maybe like just blind ambition and just, you know, it was the same way as like tracking you down and taking you to the Girls FM in my Fiat Uno and getting you to play on the radio show. And <laughs> like, I just wanted, it wasn't about even meeting my heroes. It was just people that I just was fascinated. I was drawn to America. I was drawn to the music that was coming from there. Yeah. I had these records that Derek was making, the Sound Patrol, like stuff like that, and I was like, "This is, this is, uh, it's, this must be a weirdo that made this music because I can identify with it." You yes, know. he is a weirdo. <laughs> he, of course, he is, <laughs> and that's why I love it. That's why we connect on so many levels. Yeah. You know, we, and we just, it was one of those moments where we, you know, I met Shay Damier first, and okay. Ron Trent, and okay. Cash, and, and that was my kind of, and Rob and. Yvonne that worked at, yeah. uh, at Casual, Casual yeah. and that I, I, when I was at Freetown, and that was my gateway, you know, of like, okay, well, Shay, Shay was like, me, come meet Derek, and we got drunk. Well, I, I got drunk. He rescued me. I just oh, really? passed out in the toilet at like some place <laughs> where Sneak was playing, and and it was that moment of like, oh, like this is fun. Like we're just kids hanging out right. at, at Red Nail in his old loft space with Chris Nazuka, and I just it was like I found my people. I had people at home, but I found these other people in America, and it was the same thing for Derek when he came to live with me, and it, this sort of community of weirdos built around that and, and that was the kind of history of it really you know let's start a record label okay yeah cool we love prescription but let's make a record that really well that's better than prescription that, right. was, like, right. that was the sure. flat, you know we had these like oh it's shay our friend it was it was like it was healthy competition you know that we were all like doing all these things and it was the art was sort of pushing the art and striving and everyone was trying to do something and really just figure out what this thing was right. at the same time having the most fun ever you know wow wow and it was a you know it was you know it's people like gemini spencer kinsey yeah. and yeah. like that you're hearing like i'm hearing them dj and it's just blowing my mind. i'm like what how can you play those records together that's not yeah. supposed to happen like yeah. and i love that that energy i have that amazing photo i think of us derek may uh we were in. We went for dinner next door to Gramophone. Do you remember okay. that? Like, okay. There's a photo of that from okay. years ago, and I look at that, and I'm just like, wow. We were just kids, and it's like, it was a, the world was our oyster kind of thing, you know? Yeah. You know the 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 impact that like Frankie Knuckles and Ron mm. Hardy had mm -hmm. on on DJing, mm -hmm. uh, and how I hear guys from Chicago play. Mm -hmm. So like you said. You know, how, why is it that they put these records, records together? together? I mean, those, those WBMX tapes of told the BMX with Farley yeah. playing like, yeah. I was just like, what, this is, yeah. what? <laughs> you could do this? Yes, <laughs> this yes. is incredible. Yeah, Farley and, and uh, Steve Silk used mm -hmm. to do some great, Mike mm -hmm. Hitman, mm -hmm. all those guys used to do great. I used to listen to, to those, those uh, my sister had a boyfriend from Hatman, Indiana, and he yeah. used to have the tapes. Yeah. And you know, they were mixing, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and M pop music, yeah. and you know, just yeah. it was it was like a free for all. It, it was, was a freestyle. It was, really it was amazing. incredible. So, mm. like with 
with Spencer, Spencer was real, real tripped out. He was real freaky about how he played, mm -hmm. you know, and it was just really freaking incredible, you know. You could hear he's a Gemini <laughs> when he was playing. Yeah, like, I mean, totally. <laughs> I remember he stayed yeah. at my house once and I gave him this cassette. I'd done a mix and I gave him this cassette and I went to bed. He came running down the stairs like that and he'd been up all night and he'd put the cassette on and he was high and he was crazy. He was Spencer. Yeah. Yeah. And he was like, I listen to it. You should do this and this and this. You know, you really like, he was, he would push me, like mentor me. And, yeah. but I, I just love, I, he was, I mean, bless him. He's around, but he's not, you know, and I miss him dearly. And, but he was one of those people where I just was like, like, wow. Like what, that's just raw talent. Yeah. Like, Definitely. No, there was there weren't any rules. There was nothing. It was just like I'm gonna just do this, right? And that's what he did. And you play Terence Trent Darby with an acid track and right, some other. And you'd right. be like, Bleh. you know, I wish that I had that freedom. I I, I miss that. Yeah, a lot. Because I I love all kinds of music and I love playing all kinds of music, but the vision of doing it too, because he had a had a totally different vision when he played and Der DC as well DC yeah. has like a totally different vision yeah. but again that comes from that Chicago yeah. thing yeah. you know and we didn't have that thing in Detroit and you don't have you didn't have that thing in London no from what I could no. from my experiences being there in 1989 you know it was like another I think it's weird it's, I think it almost comes, like DJ Rush is a great example I remember okay. going to a party where he was playing like he's on down the road with like a relief oh record God. at like 138 BPM <laughs> oh, right. and I, and the energy was just insane and it came from that place of like liberation and yeah. crazy and yeah. free like Chicago's history all kind of wrapped up in this chaos and right. you can't you can't really explain that unless you've been there and been through it, like met people from Chicago right. to really understand that. Right. Like right. Detroit has its identity yeah. and the people I know and the music sounds like the people that I've met from Detroit. Sure. I feel that with Chicago, it's a similar thing. Yeah. It's like you can't explain it till you, you're around it, you know. What's the strangest place you ever DJed? The strangest place I ever DJed, uh, it was the strangest situation. It was at Zook in Singapore. I'm sure there's a lot of stranger things, but the prime minister came oh when God. I was DJing and they had this procession across the dance floor and she insisted on standing right next to me when I was DJing and watching me and asking me questions while I was trying to play and couldn't understand why people were dancing and did I have like a button that made people dance? <laughs> was it a stop and go thing? That's crazy. And it was, I was like, wait, what is, go I don't understand. There were security <laughs> guards there. And I still, for this to this day, I was like, that was just the weirdest wow. thing. She was convinced that, that I just sort of was commanding people to dance with some, with a green light that wow. I was pressing. <laughs> okay, you can dance now. Jesus. So that was a pretty strange and weird scenario. Yeah. All right, this is Uncle Carl from Uncle Carl Ass with Luke Solomon, who has a green button. <laughs> to make people, to make people dance. So. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great, wouldn't it? Just hit yeah, the green button. <laughs> so instead of drop, you yeah, yeah. dance. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, from Glitterbox here at High and Ibiza, Uncle Carl Ass. See you next time.